All right, well, welcome back to our study. It's good to see you, everybody, making it back out, staying with it. Uh, we're going to uh, continue here for this week and next week, and we've got a couple weeks with different things happening, and it's actually a fairly good timing for us. Um, as we've discussed, we live currently in the period known as the Church Age. Uh, that is the period between the 69th and the 70th weeks of Daniel. Uh, it's an undetermined period of time. We don't know how long it is because Jesus said no one knows the hour of the day, including himself. And so we're living in this period of time where the church is the way the Lord is working in the world. He worked through his people Israel until that transition when Christ came. Now he works through his church. Israel will come back into the picture. He will work again through Israel as we will discover in the book of Revelations a little bit later. But for now, we're talking about churches for a reason. Since this is the church age, he is working through a church today, the book of Revelation begins with the church. And what the book of Revelation starts with is talking about certain churches. There are literal churches in the day that John wrote these, but there are also churches throughout the history of the church. And what it shows is seven different types of churches. And it mentions good things, it mentions bad things, and it gives warnings and corrections. There's a reason for that. Before Christ returns, He's giving the church a chance to repent. Giving the church a chance to get it right. Because once we finish talking about these churches, we don't talk about the church anymore until the actual return of Christ. And so that's a good thing because we don't experience the, the great wrath of God. Uh, but it's a tough thing for us to step back and look at ourselves in the mirror of God's Word and say, wow, we look a little bit like that. And that's, that's a good thing for us, and I hope we'll do it tonight. Okay, uh, now we have covered the first three churches so far. I'll give you a quick summary and give you their type of church because they are tight. The first church, the church at Ephesus, is the Apostolic Church. Okay, it's the Apostolic Church. This was the church uh, that the disciples started. This was the church that had solid leadership. This was the church that worked hard. Uh, this was the church that persevered. This was the church that removed the evil people from the church. This is the church that would not tolerate false teaching. This was a sound biblical church. But unfortunately, after about a generation, it lost its true love. It forgot why it existed. It was just doing church. It was doing church well, but it was just doing church. And that's a very dangerous place to be. Uh, we can see it today. There are several issues that have come up in, in our generation. Uh, that I'll just throw out there. When you love a specific translation more than you love the truth being translated, you're in danger of losing your first love. When you love music styles and they're more important to you than the words that are being sung, you've probably lost your first love. Um, when you concern more about the way a person dresses than the person themselves, you've probably lost your first love. These are just modern examples of how the church at Ephesus does exist today. There are solid Bible teaching churches that unfortunately have gotten caught up in things that have caused them to forget why they exist. We exist to go, make, and teach disciples. That's why we exist. And we can't let church get in the way of that. Okay? So that does happen. All right? And he said, what was the warning? Turn back to me and do the works you first did. In other words, get back to the basics. Get back to why you exist. Make and teach disciples. The second church, the church at Smyrna, was the persecuted church. Okay? This is the persecuted church. Uh, this church truly experienced the hatred of the world. Uh, they were persecuted terribly for their faith. But Jesus said they were rich. They were rich because they had an inheritance laid up where moths and rust cannot touch. Um, the persecution was temporary, but their blessings were eternal. Most of us really have no clue what persecution is like and what they experienced. I doubt anyone in this room has suffered greatly because of our faith. But as we discussed during that teaching, we're just a few steps away from it. We're really not far from that happening, and I think persecution will grow in our lifetime. I have no doubt about it. So we need the same warning that they had. Remain faithful even when facing death. That's what they were told. Even in persecution, remain faithful. So we need to remember that. Now... If you look at these, and I told you there were several approaches. One is the literal. And it's obvious that these were literal churches, because you could walk from Ephesus to Smyrna to the next church, and it would have been like a person walking, delivering an, a route. And so obviously they were real churches in the day that John wrote this, probably 80s to 90 AD. 
real churches, but they're preserved for us because these are types of churches. Some see it two ways, and I think both work. Some see it linearly. The church at Ephesus was that first century church. That was the apostolic church. The church of Smyrna represents the persecuted church, which had been the second and third and early fourth centuries A.D., which the church was persecuted. The next church would be the church of Pergamum, the state church. Okay? The state church, which we discussed, the church of Pergamum, they compromised. Um, they did not refuse, did, uh, did not deny Jesus Christ, excuse me, in the face of martyrdom and persecution, but they, they did tolerate other doctrines. Basically, they were becoming politically correct. They didn't want to offend. And, and we see that as you look in the history of the church, 300 to 600 um, A.D., the church started to get married up to the state. And that's where big Catholic church came in, big C. They were married to the state. They were all together. And because of it, many bad things happened for the next thousand years in the church. Right? Like the selling of indulgences. Huge, huge problem that the church got caught up in because it married the state. So when the church marries the state, you got a problem. You have a state church, and that's not a healthy church. And, and like these guys, they were warned very clearly, repent of your sin. Repent of your sin. It's not okay to be married to the state. Okay? So now we move on to the next two churches, and this is where our reading picks up. It picks up in Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 through 3, 6. And so turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, starting at verse 18. Again, this is Jesus speaking. John saw Jesus Christ, his best friend on earth. He identifies him. And this is Jesus giving his word literally to John. Okay? It says, Jesus says to John, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. This is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. I know all the things you do. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. And I can see your constant improvement in all these things. Wow, sounds like a great church. But I have this complaint against you. You're permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She, excuse me, she teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat food offered to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her immorality. Therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from her evil deeds. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person, and I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. But... I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira, Thyatira, who have not followed this false teaching. Deep truths, as they call them, depths of Satan, actually. I will ask nothing more of you, except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. To all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, to them I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule with the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I receive from my Father, and I will also give them the morning star. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He's saying to the churches. Let's go on to the next church, then we'll break them down. Write this letter to the church, or to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars, that's Jesus Christ. I know all the things you do, and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. That's pretty good. Wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. Yet there are some in the church of Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life. But I will announce before my Father and His angels that they are mine. 
Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. Okay? Let's ask for the Lord's blessing in His Word. Father, thank You for Your Word which was preserved for this day. Uh, Father, we need to hear it. That's why we're here. And so there are things that we, we need to understand about the way you believe church should function and the way it should not. And so thank you for that. Thank you that we still have time to repent if necessary. And thank you as we see in both of these churches that, yeah, there are some who need help, but yes, there are others who are faithful. And I thank you for those in our church who remain faithful and strong. And thank you for the reminder of the reward for that. And so now bless our study. Uh, again, may we apply it to our own church and our own personal lives as we leave here tonight. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now let's talk about these two churches. Let's give some historical background, which is very important in both of them. Uh, Thyatira was about 30 miles southeast of Pergamos. Okay? It's a small agricultural city that started, was started by Alexander the Great after he conquered the Persian Empire. And yes, there's clear evidence of a church in the literal city of Thyatira today. You can go there and you can see it. So we know it's a literal church in the first century. Now, we're going to call this church the Worldly Church. This is the Worldly Church. Some would think this represents the church of today. All right. If you're looking at this in series, some believe that this church could represent the church of today. It's possible. All right. Uh, this is the worldly church. Things were different here for the Christian church in Thyatira. Um, they had little political or religious significance in the region. Uh, for that reason, the believers were not persecuted hardly at all. Um, but there was a more subtle, or subtle temptation, and that's social acceptance. That was the big temptation. Thyatira was a manufacturing town, and this history is really neat. Uh, the major industries of the region had shops in Thyatira. Edward Heitzen, one of the uh, one of the scholars of the end times, he said this in his book. He said, it was a town dominated by trade guilds and powerful designing women. Right? That's why the town was known. So there's some very interesting cultural his and historical elements here. These trade guilds in Thyatira were critical. Uh, you could not make a living without being a member of a trade guild. And the guilds were pagan societies. They literally focused on idol worship, these trade guilds. Each one of them had a god. Okay? All the trade guilds had a god. People back in those days were very mystical. They believed in other gods. And so each guild had its own god. And so they would have, at least once a year, feasts to honor their pagan gods. All the workers were expected to attend, and not just attend, but participate. And all of them had these three things in common. They would always pour out a cup of wine in worship of their particular God. They always had a fellowship meal, which included excessive drinking and drunkenness. And there was sexual immorality was practiced at these events. And so think about it. These people, to make a living, um, had to not only attend them, but had to participate, or otherwise they would be shunned, and they would not have work. Okay? they didn't attend, they ran the risk of being rejected by the trade guild, and then they wouldn't be able to provide for their families. So, obviously, that made for some tough decisions, especially in these new Christians' lives in the first century. Uh, knowing that background, our reading makes a little more sense. So let's, let's break it down a bit. Jesus said, I know all the things you do. He says that at the beginning of every church. That's a reminder that Jesus knows everything the church does. It's His church. He's the head of it. He doesn't miss anything. Not an event, not a service, not an activity. He knows everything the church does. And as we see, not everything is good. There is some good, but there's a lot of bad. So let's focus on the good. He always starts with the good first. The good in this church was, man, this was a loving church. This was definitely a loving church. Uh, they certainly followed in the instructions of the Word. As we'll come across in our Ephesians study, one of the things we're commanded to do is live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. And so that was something that was said of this church. They were a church of love. Okay? They evidenced Christ's love. They were also a church of faith. He mentioned that their faith was strong. And it's another compliment that hopefully can be said of us. As believers, we should be known for our faith. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, my righteous ones will live by faith, right? We will live by faith. Uh, the problem of the information age, uh, uh, this hit me, 
is proved, proved somewhat detrimental to this because even professing Christians will argue, I want more facts, right? I want more facts. There's more available. I want more facts. Well, at some point you have to live by faith. The Bible says we believe that God created everything by faith. And so we can't have the facts necessarily. No one was alive when that happened with God. Uh, but that's just an example. We have to live by faith. And that should be said of us. Here's another big one. This church was known for its service. These, these people were servants. They, they took the skills and the talents and the gifts that God gave them. And they did what they were supposed to do. They used them in the local church. So this church was known for its servants. And of course we should be known as well. 1 Peter reminds us in 5, five, all of you Christians serve each other in humility. Right? Serve each other in humility. So we should be people of service, just like this church, a lot we can model. He also says they endured. He says endurance was a good thing in this church. Another critical proof of their saving faith. Uh, we all face tests and temptations. We all have those times in our lives where we want to give in. But we should be like this church. This church was known for its endurance. And we know that with, when you endure, God blesses you. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. So think about it. This sounds like a good church, doesn't it? Wouldn't you like to be known by these things? And we look at them. Wow. Love, faith, service, endurance. That to me sounds really awesome. But it wasn't. There were still some problems in this church. Let's talk about the bad. Here's the bad, and it's a huge, not good thing. They compromised with the socially acceptable immorality of the times. Wow. Okay, this is a Romans 12, 2 thing. Right? They gave in to the traditions and customs of the day. Uh, some of the people in this church were on the right track. Notice he separated them. He, he did. He said very clearly, not everybody's like this. But unfortunately, there were those who were caught up in it. Remember I talked about the trade unions, I mean the trade guilds. Um, they were close organizations. They were like families, like mafia. Many of them were headed by powerful, influential women. We know that from history. And at their feasts, as I mentioned to you, they would eat food that was given to idols, and they would drink heavily, and they would practice sexual immorality. And if you did participate you would most likely lose your job and not be able to feed your family. Now, let's think about this the way somebody would think of it today. Okay? The church member were in this deal, then they're making good money. If they're making good money, they're giving good money to the church, right? Because this is a good church. I make good money at what I do, so I help support the Lord's work with my money. So if I want to keep supporting the Lord's work, then I have to participate in what's going on here. I have to just kind of suck it up and, and say, this is for the good of the church. I need to go to these parties. I need to drink. I need to do everything else because the boss expects it. And if I don't do what the boss expects, I'm going to lose my job. And if I lose my job, I can't give money to the church, and that's a bad thing, right? Right? Okay? I've heard that logic. I've heard that logic, and it's been used here in our church. <laughs> and people that have counseled. I've got to do it. This is how I feed my family. I've got to do that. I, I can tie it to the church X amount of dollars by doing this. Should not be given a pass. Because this is what my education is. Or this is what my trade is. And if I don't do this, I don't know how I'm going to live. And so I'm, God must be okay with what I'm doing. No, God's not. And He wasn't okay with what was going on here in this church. Um, there's a big trap. And this is the trap that this church fell into. Um, James says, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. That's what was happening in this church with a lot of the people. They were caught up in the things of the world. They had let someone come in and bring in these other teachings, these teachings of sexual immorality that it's okay, these teachings that drunkenness are okay, these teachings that it's okay to, to eat food given to idols when they knew better. These, this is not the case. But they tolerated it. They allowed it in the church. In other words, they allowed the customs and tradition of the world to be brought into the church. Hmm. That's not okay. You can't play in both worlds. Right? You can't be a Christian on Sunday and a heathen the rest of the week. Um, you can't justify sinful lifestyles. The church is not allowed to do that. Uh, and yet the church definitely tries to do it. As one author said, as said, Heinzen, um, like modern churches today, 
the believers of Thyatira preferred social acceptance to spiritual integrity. They wanted to tolerate sin in the name of cultural accommodation. What's happening today that matches this? Come on. What's the church accepting today in order for social accommodation? Okay. Say it louder. Homosexual marriage, right? Their denomination splitting. They're doing exactly what this church was warned about. And I've, I've got brothers on both sides. I've got brothers on both sides because I'm a chaplain. I've got people of all different denominations. And so I, I, I have those conversations. And I get to hear what's going on. And uh, it's exactly what's happening today. The world says it must be okay. So there are churches that are saying we need to accommodate in order to keep our doors open. Because if we offend the people who are giving, then the doors, church, church's doors are going to close. And we need to accommodate. And that's not okay, right? right? And we hear this very clearly. That's what they were being warned about. That's what this Jezebel, this, this, this person had brought into the church with social acceptance of this immorality. And, and people were buying it in the church. And, and so they were told, this is not okay. You can't live in both worlds. Okay? And so think about it. So-called spiritual leaders uh, were bringing in sexual immorality in the church. Are they doing it today? Absolutely. And it's out of fear of calling sin sin. It's out of fear of calling sin sin being considered intolerant. So anyway, big churches have to have big money. Um, here's the warning. The warning is very clear. Uh, church of Thyatira had some good people, had some not so good people. And so I like the way Jesus puts it. This is comforting, actually, as well as it's concerning. He says, I am the one who searches out the thoughts and the intentions of every person. And I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. So in other words, you can't fool Jesus. You can fool people, but you can't fool Jesus. He knows where your heart really is. Uh, you and I can try to justify sinful behavior. We can color it any way we want. He knows our intentions. He knows our thoughts, right? and He will give us what we deserve. Uh, that was what was said about this church. Listen, listen to what the powerful, influential female leader deserved. I will throw her into a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly. And listen, there's still a gleam of hope. He said, unless. Unless. Unless they repent and turn away from her deeds. So the person who was leading the church astray was already condemned. God had already, it's kind of like Pharaoh. God had already tried to burden her heart. God had already tried to turn her away. She was cold. She was not going to turn. She was, all right, she's condemned. But those who are caught up in following her have an opportunity to repent. You can say, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. I need to be right with God. So we still see God's mercy in this. God's mercy in a church today who has gotten away. In a church or denomination who is accepting sexual immorality, people in the congregation still have a choice. If the leader has led them astray, they can still say, absolutely not. I'm not going to follow that. I'm going to repent of that. And we're seeing it. It is happening. Okay? Definitely is happening. So there's a severe punishment for those who deserve it. And there's a blessing for those who deserve it. So, thankfully, not all of them were caught up in it. Uh, some had stayed true. And those are the ones who are going to be blessed. Jesus said, hold tightly at what you have. Those who are holding on, hold tightly. You're going to be victorious. Okay? And this is where we get um, some of our saying, like some people don't like eternal security. They don't like that statement because it's abused. Here's where you get the perseverance of the saints. When we look in the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, we get the clear description of true saints will persevere. And that's where we, again, can hang our hat on real security. True saints will persevere. And that's what he's saying in this church. He's saying, those of you who are real, I know your thoughts, I know your intentions, you're going to get what you deserve. You're going to get heaven and more. But those who don't, they'll get what they deserve as well. So, neat. Neat church. Again, full of trade unions. They were run by trade unions, and they were pagan organizations. And to be caught up in a pagan organization, you had to compromise, or did you really? Okay? Did you really? Now, Next church is a quick one to discuss. We'll take it a few minutes. Um, this one's pretty easy. The church at Sardis is the dead church. Okay? Is the dead church. Um, again, some see that as a possible future church from today, that the church itself 
will be dead. If you go to some countries, though, you will find dead churches. If you go to some places in our own country, you will find dead churches. Right? You'll clearly find them. So this church of Sardis, this was, this was an old industry town. You've been to old industry towns that have the old uh, track housing. They had the old shop, little cinder block houses, and now they're in West Virginia everywhere, that they're ghost towns. They're vacant because industry is left. Get that in your mind. Get an old coal town in your mind. That's what have been Sardis at this time. At one point it was booming. At one point it was like five corners. There were five major roads that came through here, so there was major commerce, but that commerce had died by the time this church was in this state. And so this was a dead place. There was no new business. There were no young people. Uh, this was a dead agriculture, or a dead uh, economic city. And so you can imagine what the church was suffering from. The church was dying too. And that's the bad thing. Uh, the bad thing is, and he said it very clearly, this dead church was defined this way. Their actions didn't meet God's requirements. Didn't meet God's requirements. And that's why they were dead. They weren't doing anything wrong because he would have said what they were doing wrong. Uh, but they weren't doing anything right because there would have been something good listed. So this church was just kind of in existence. And, and you can picture it, can't you? People came, got in their clothes on Sunday morning. They came and opened the doors of the church. They came and went through their motions. They finished going through their motions. They shut the doors of the church. They went back home and went about their lives. Right? They never did anything with what they learned or heard or understood. They just went through the motions of church. Does that exist today? Boy, does it ever. A lot of churches like that. A whole lot of churches like that. There are a lot of dead churches today. That's why I'll argue that these churches are all represented in every age. I could see them as linear, there's no question, in a, in a progression or in progression and regression. But I also see them existing in every period. Because there are good churches today, like Ephesus. Uh, there are churches that are somewhat persecuted in the world today. Uh, and there are churches that have given in to the state. There are churches that have given into society, and there are dead churches. They all exist, I think, at one time, and most scholars will agree. Okay? Now, the, one of my scholars I talked, I read through on this particular church, this dead church, uh, gave us some additional warnings, and then these are these are neat. Uh, three ways to kill a church. One is tradition. Uh, a quick way to kill a church and make a church die is to have a death grip on traditions. Uh, you remember the story of the, the Holy Radiator? You might remember that one? I used that a long time ago, and it's, it's a true story. This pastor had been in his church forever. I mean, he had, he had seen babies born, seen kids married, baptized them, baptized their kids. And, and, and you know, he had, he had seen generations. He had been there for a long, long time. And finally, he hung it up. He had to quit. And so he, res he resigned, and he retired, actually. And they brought in this new young guy, and he was trying his best. He was trying his best because the church was older. You know, the church usually will have an average age plus or minus the age of the pastor. That's typical. And so if this guy's in his 70s, maybe even 80s, I don't know how old he was. Guess how old the congregation was? 60s to 80s. And so he had an older congregation. So they bring a younger guy trying to turn things around, trying to get this dead church going. And he could not understand what was wrong. He was just being shut down at every turn. It was just awful. And so he, he called up this older pastor, because he was still living, still in the area, and asked him, what's he doing wrong? And he, he'd encourage him to get back in there and do, you know, do the things you're doing. You're doing the right things. Finally, the chairman of the deacon board approaches him. And he says, we got a problem. And, uh, and he says, oh, well, finally, we're going to learn it. He says, you don't do communion right. It's like, what? You don't do communion right. What do you mean? You don't touch the radiator. Before Pastor So and So did communion, he always went over and touched the radiator, then he handed out communion. You're not doing it right. So he calls up the pastor. This is a true story. He calls up Pastor So and So and says, Hey, they just told me what's wrong. I'm not doing communion right. They, they said, You always touch the radiator. And he laughs. He said, Yeah, I didn't want to shock anybody. <laughs> you see the sense in that? That church died because. It held on to traditions. It was just simply a practice that someone did that turned into a tradition. And everybody who worshipped their tradition more than what they were actually supposed to be doing. Dangerous to hold on to traditions too long and too tightly. Prejudice. We talked about this on Sunday morning. The church is no place for prejudice. 
Uh, a lot of churches are homogenous. That just means they're all alike. And they don't want anybody who's not alike. There are churches out there today and within Storm Stone's Throw that if, if, if somebody with tattoos and blue jeans showed up, they would be run out the door. If a lady showed up, a single mother with her kids, and her kids were screaming and crying, she'd be shown the door. Um, you know, there are places like that. We like the way we are. We like the way we look and the way we sound. We're comfortable here. Don't mess with that. And that's not okay. Okay, that's not okay. Andy Stanley, I'll be right with Andy in a minute. Hang on. Let me share the third point. Third point is the, the more, I think, the more dangerous, and that's complacency. Like I described in this church, you get going through the motions. You know, we've got things, things are cooking, things are gelling. I like the way things are going, you know, and we just get complacent. We start getting in our practice and our routines, and, and we don't step out in faith and try new things, and we don't go out and reach out for the lost. We don't do the things we're supposed to do. Um, it's, it's very, very subtle, but it will kill a church. Uh, there, are, again, there are many churches within a short drive of us right now that, that fit these things. Uh, they unlock the door Sunday morning. They let the people in, they lock the doors when people leave, they don't to open them again until sometime later. And the church is a museum. It's a museum, and that's not okay. Uh, I've, I've been to several of Andy's, uh, Andy Stanley's, Charles Stanley's son. Uh, I've been down into several of their uh, pastor's trainings. And uh, he was answering a concern by a church member, because their church is pretty large. He says, if we start growing, how will we maintain a warm, intimate family atmosphere? Okay? I hear people talk about that. I want a warm, intimate family atmosphere. This was his answer. You walk into a church and already know everyone who's there. Clearly nobody embraced the Great Commission. Ouch. If you go to a church and you know everybody that's there, you failed the Great Commission. When I look in the New Testament and he says, I see no evidence of any group saying, our four no more. We know everyone here and we're comfortable. Boy, there are a lot of churches like that. And that's not okay. That's a dead church. And they exist today. They're dead because they're not sharing the gospel with anybody. They're holding to themselves. And they've died. But guess what the morning was? I love it. Wakey, wakey. Right? Wake up! Alright, wake up, guys. Come on, wake up. It's not a country club. Wake up. It's not a social gathering. Wake up. It's not your weekend family reunion. Wake up. It's not your church. Whose church is it? Jesus Christ, right? It's His church. He said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell won't stand against it, but it'll stand against your church. If it's your church. Okay? If it's your church. You've got to be careful about these things. What are we told to do? Go out to the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you can to come so that the house will be full. Right? So it'll be full and alive, I'll say that's what we're called to do. Okay? Thankfully, there were some still alive in that church. They were just asleep. And all they needed to do was wake up. They weren't finished yet. But boy, it was a strong, strong warning to this church. Nothing good said about it. But thankfully, Christ hadn't returned yet. So there's time for good to be said. Okay, what's our summary? Our summary from these two churches we see is a victorious church will be an open church with an open Bible. Okay, it'll be an open church that everybody will be welcome in, and we'll have an open Bible. Everything we do will be done according to God's Word, not according to the influence of any outside source, whether it be the culture, whether it be the, the political environment, whatever it is. This will be a church that is open to everyone with an open Bible. That's the victorious church. That's what we need to be. Okay, and that's what we learned from this passage, right? Um, Anything you gathered from this study that maybe I didn't bring out? Everybody else like me wants to go watch the Stanley Cup playoffs, right? Probably most of you don't even know they're on. All right. Anyway, that's okay. All right, Tommy, would you come? We're going we're gonna to turn to page 470, and we're going to close with a song.